Hi, my name is Steve Collins, and I'm with the Collins Group, obviously, here at Keller Williams Realty. And um, a few people know a little bit about my past, a lot of people don't. And I think the thing that I get asked a lot is, why are you always so happy? Why are you in such a good mood all the time? I've even had somebody mad at me. They say, you know, why are you always in a good mood? And it's funny, perspective will do that to you. You know, it's just the perspective that you have on life. So the story began years and years ago, and I'll make it super short, and that was, my father was a decorated war hero in Vietnam, a helicopter pilot, you know, Purple Cross, Distinguished Flying Cross. And yet he married my mom, went to Vietnam, and when he came back, uh, I was there, you know, so she got pregnant like on a honeymoon. So he came back to a family, and he came back really stressed out. And so not really having that father kind of figure, and then the one that was there was, was kind of brooding and overbearing. So I sought, as I was growing up, approval from, uh, you know, my peers. Pretty much it, and it led into me being hyperactive at the time. They called it back then, and I'm 44, so when I was younger, they called it hyperactivity. So they put me on Ritalin when I was really, really young, and um, so that made me not hungry. I never wanted to eat, so I was the skinniest, tiniest little kid at the school. And um, what I remember, some of my earliest thoughts about that was, why am I going to the doctor? What's wrong with me? Why am I not like other kids? Why am I not normal? And, um, you know, why do I have to take something to make me normal? And uh, so it was, it was, you know, early thoughts of doubting myself, my self-image, and just thoughts about who I was as a person and what was wrong with me. Why couldn't everybody just be hyper and happy, you know? Um, I was at a Catholic school at the time, and it was all nuns, and um, I was the disruptive force. That was, you know, kind of disruptive force. So as the disruptive force, I remember thinking to myself, something's wrong with me. Why do I have to take medicine to be normal? And uh, my sixth grade year, I transferred to a public school, and it was during that time that, because I was the littlest, tiniest guy, um, I was like the bullseye for bullies. And so I got bullied and bullied and bullied. That's when I started using drugs, you know, to kind of fit in. I had been off the Ritalin, and while others were using drugs to kind of catch a buzz or feel good, it was like my self-medication. It allowed me to kind of just be at a normal state because I wasn't hyper anymore. Um, and the problem with that is it became progressive and progressive and progressive and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And my uh, senior year in high school, I'd been dating for about two years, my girlfriend, and uh, we discovered that she got pregnant. And so I got rebellious and told my parents, that's it, I'm gonna get married, I'm gonna have a family. And I was like a total idiot. I didn't know anything. I thought I knew everything. And so, you know, we, uh, you know, picked up a, a license at the courthouse and, and we tried to go this thing. And because of my drug use, it kept getting worse and worse. And I remember during that time feeling uh, elated that there was a child coming into the world. And at the same time feeling this incredible sense of dread that um, I, I honestly didn't, you know, I, I knew I couldn't stop using drugs at that time. And so I had this horrible dichotomy going on where I wanted to be this great father and husband, but I couldn't because I had this addiction that was just an unbreakable thing. And it wound up with terrible fights over the year. She ended up separating from me and getting pregnant from another guy. And I wound up in the state hospital here in San Antonio, Texas, in a place called Goyans Hall. And it was during that time, it was the lowest of the lowest of the lowest. She had disappeared. My daughter was gone. I didn't know where they were. I knew she was pregnant from some other guy and, you know, sent me divorce papers. And here I am locked up in the state hospital. And it was, it was during that time there, I remember my lowest low was laying on a gurney in the detox room next to a guy who was detoxing from heroin. And, you know, he's throwing up on himself. I'm laying in here, hot tears running down my cheeks. And the sense that I have is, uh, you're a worthless human being. You are a liability to everybody. You're a horrible father, you're a horrible son, you're a horrible husband, you're a horrible human being. You're worthless to society. I mean, there, you have no redeeming value at all. And I remember owning this and just, just crying hot tears because I thought, I'm more of a benefit to my parents dead because maybe at least I'll have insurance money and I didn't want to live. I remember saying, if you're really real and you can just help me, um, I'll give you my life, whatever you want. Whatever you want to do, that's it, because I don't want to live. I'm a, I'm a failure as a man, I'm a failure as a human being, I'm a failure as a creation of yours. I'm just 
worthless. I'm a liability to everybody in my life. I've destroyed everything that you've given to me. And um, it was during that time that I just kind of surrendered and said, if you're really real and you really care, if you can just help me, I'm yours. And shortly after being released from the hospital, I ran into a gentleman that we're still friends with now. This was 24 years ago that um, I won't get into a lot of details, but let's just say God used this guy. And he came into my life and just read my mail that day and said, you know, I've been praying. And he was a total stranger, you know, and just read my mail, knew everything that was going on with me at that time and said, the Lord sent me here to pray with you. And he prayed with me at that time and I was so ready. And I just said, I surrender, I'm yours, you know, whatever you want me to do. So um, that was on a Friday, that Sunday, I was invited to be baptized and I had already been baptized as a baby, as a Catholic, but they said, well, no, I mean, Jesus did this as an adult. This was an adult decision, you know. This is something that, you know, even in the New Testament, John the Baptist was baptizing adults. So make a decision, you know, if you want to do this. I said, well, heck yeah, I'm in, you know, I'll do it. Well, my thought was if I'm just hanging around church people, surely I won't, you know, be doing the things that I used to do in the past because I kind of had a thought that, well, I'll be hanging around with folks that probably don't do the things that I did. Um, I, never, I never even had a conception that I could be delivered and completely healed and the addiction just broken and gone to where there was no desire, no shame, no guilt, no nothing, just a complete restoration. I had no idea, but that's what happened during the baptism. So I got baptized and when I came up out of the water, this is kind of the guy, you know, that, that came out and that was 24 years ago. So that began a journey of me pausing and uh, my coaching, I guess you could say my initial coaching. So I have this one coaching manual. It's really cool. It's been around for a couple thousand years. <laughs> and I've got the voice of this coach that um, will give me direction from time to time in choices that I make. And most of the choices that I have made have not been because I'm smart or because I'm uh, so experienced or knowledgeable. It's because I've taken time to pause and ask, what do you want me to do? Where should I go? What should I do? Because um, that agreement I made laying in that gurney in the state hospital guides me every day, which is, if you'll just help me, I'm yours forever. Whatever you want me to do, I'm gonna do it. And um, that led me to starting a Bible study years ago. And um, I felt impressed strongly to just reach out to the top agents in San Antonio and Craig Owen and I had an opportunity to meet and visit, spend some time together and we did that for a couple of years and that's when he was going to be coming on board as a team leader so we had a conversation. He says, why don't you come by over here and, and with uh, Keller Williams? And I said, absolutely, I'll do that. I noticed that when I got to Keller Williams, the values were God, family and business and what I recognized is that, um, you know, that's kind of like saying spend less than you make. That's kind of like saying, um, burn more calories than you take in. I mean, in theory, it's perfect and brilliant. And for the most part, I observed it to be uh, rhetoric, where it was just, you know, it was a neat saying. So the last um, 12 to 13, yeah, the last 10 years here, I've really purposed to make that uh, real for me. And having a family now, having seven children, being married to Angela, be 18 years, the ability to do that has been and will be an ongoing challenge. But the fact that I am connected to a company who says from the owner, here's our value system. Um, this is the guidance that Gary Keller has put out there. Here it is. And I know that can mean a lot of things for a lot of people. And I'm like, totally cool with that. Everybody's got their own way of approaching that. My way is, is very simple, is what do you want me to do today, Lord? How should I go about this? What are we doing today, Dad? You know, what are we going to do today? And living that adventure and following the path of what I feel like is my shepherd's voice and being led in that direction. And then when business and um, family come up as a challenge, I just speak it. I just go, my values are God, family, and business, so I'm going to choose family. And, um, you know, I think when all the kids are grown and gone, then I may be a real formidable force in the real estate industry. But for right now, it's uh, number three on my priority scale. And living it out is challenging, you know, because to put them first feels like I'm being a bad business person. Or to invest energy and time and effort in God and the family means I'm not investing what I could invest over here. But ultimately, I didn't say, 
if you can help me, I'll be the best realtor I can be. I said, you know, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And that's pretty much my story. You know, I just am very grateful and thankful for the opportunity to be a part of a culture where we don't have to shine, uh, hide our light under a basket. You know, we can be who we are and, um, and it's uh, celebrated, it's not tolerated. And um, having a heart for everybody in this company to see them become better has been very motivating to me. I, I've been able to expand beyond my family and really focus on doing what I can to give back to the company, whatever I may have. Whatever good is there, um, I'm happy to share as much as I can. And that's the story of me.